Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you um, to Chiku and to the programs here um, for hosting me this week. It's really a treat to be here um, and to be working with all of you. The title for this lecture um, was broad enough to accommodate whatever would end up <laughs> in it. Um, so the focus of today's lecture is a little bit, um, uh, is a part of that sort of all-encompassing title. Um, I'm not a scholar and um, I'm not hi a historian and the talk draws on both disciplines or both, um, both history and um, a kind of ethnography, I guess, of a poetry community. Um, so I am going to speak for a little bit, provide a context for a work then I want to present um, by the poet Armand Schwerner, who died a few years ago. And, um, and then I'd be very grateful for any of your additions, corrections, comments, what have you. Um, I'll, I have my own remarks to make about the text. Um, um, but I did want to set it up with a kind of erroneous, perhaps, false context beforehand. Um, so that's the sort of frame for it um, today. After Denise Riley and herself, I want to begin with a personal note on my own fascination with the work I'll discuss today, which is an annex to my seminar this week on poets' relationships with other mostly literary texts. As someone who came of, an, of age, a generation after the poets, most importantly, your recent guest, Jerome Rothenberg, who became engaged in the historical ethnography and the recovering of linguistic events we might now more respectfully divvy off into the academic tropes of comparative literature, religious studies, anthropology, and other historically accidental disciplines. And as one who selves, most of them at least, were more contemporarily boundaried by feminism, what seemed to inform the enterprise behind the work by Rothenberg, Clayton Eshelman, Dennis Tedlock, and others was less a rigorous questioning of the privilege we accorded the written over the oral, or the investigation of other premises and valuations for literary culture, but a peculiarly, and an, uh, I apologize for this perspective, but it's inevitably mine, a peculiarly male, and here white male, continuance of both the romantic fallacy, the glorification of the inevitable projection of an here a single individual's consciousness on the world, and at its most benign, a goofy justification for male sexual vulnerability in the feminization of nature infected by the contemporary squaring off of Freudians and Jungians in the late 60s and 70s, or in the 60s and 70s. Feminism of the era had its own forays into this, the pieces of it at least that blended most readily with what was called then without irony, and that's sort of the sort of underlying theme of the talk is what could this be without irony? Um, the sexual revolution, all of the investigation with mirrors and Stevie Nicks dresses of the earth mother selves. But I was young enough to find this laughable, a kind of bumbling self-seriousness that missed the fact that even calling nature natural or indifferent was a pathetic grab at a useless hegemony. So even 10 years after the publication of Jerome Rothenberg's iconic anthology, Technicians of the Sacred, which he prefaced in 1967, 
as containing texts he could delimit and recognize as poems, quote, by analogy, in this case, to the work of modern poets, unquote. The idea of this subjugation was acknowledged as suspect, and his 1984 preface offered a series of explicit cautions about the transcriptions, translations, and approximations of texts occasioned by an abundance of contexts being read as anything but variations authored by the contributors. And yet the idea of shaman was still enough unsullied despite the work already underway in a burning journal called L equals A equals N equals G equals U, et cetera, that despite the work already underway, oh, uh, that Rothenberg cited contemporary poets' aspiration to shamanism as an argument that these like-minded North American, 99% male and white poets were equipped to author fair approximations. All of this seems so wrong-headed and blinkered now, it is difficult to conjure a time and group of individuals for whom this revisioning for vision was also a keen marker and spirit, and much of the ethos seemed fueled by peyote, LSD, mushrooms, and hashish, and collecting was a and collecting was a progressive act, but that is a part of what I would like to do here before presenting Schwerner. After City College and a stint in the Army, and some of you may already be familiar with this, having heard and seen Jerome Rothenberg so recently. Jerome Rothenberg returned to his natal New York and began graduate study at Columbia about a decade after the Columbia graduates Kerouac and Ginsburg had left Columbia University for the road. By the time he was finishing in 1959, he had run across Armand Schwerner, another young poet, who had returned to Columbia for his doctorate after some post-BA time off. Kenneth Koch, who beat them to his own Columbia gowning by a decade, took a post in the English department that year 1959 was also the year Robert Lowell published Life Studies and won his Pulitzer for it the year after. There had been no march on Washington, no assassination of John Kennedy, uh, no moon landing. New York City was a conflation of the poor in the Bronx and uptown immigrant communities throughout the boroughs and the Lower East Side, the moneyed sellouts of madmen schooled in the 50s, the art world's new center on the edge between upstart rigor and a few decades of entitlement, and the whole swath of young individuals maligned as beatniks. Playboy in June of that year published Kerouac's Is There a Beat Generation, which he had given the year before at a forum at Hunter College in New York. Quote, it is because I am beat, that is, I believe in beatitude and that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to it. Who knows but that the universe is not one of vast sea of compassion actually, the veritable holy honey Beneath all this show of personality and cruelty, he wrote, the earth is an Indian thing he had written in On the Road, and in the new prosperity of Buddhism among the beats, had published his novel The Dharma Bums the year before. Um. A claim that psilocybin, LSD, and other drugs would expand consciousness and aid in the investigation of the world was filtering through the culture, and young, mostly white artists and writers and musicians decided foregoing a 40-hour week was not a cataclysmic risk when they could share a cold water flat for a couple of 20s a month. Blake and Shelley were their avatars. Translation from the, first, from the French surrealists as well as from non-European writers had begun to have a local influence. The first English language translations of the Peruvian Caesar Vallejo 
whose complete poems Clayton Eshelman would publish in translation decades later, had just begun to appear in journals. These translations by Robert Bly and James Wright, among others known as deep image poets. Four years later, these would be published in a chapbook called 20 Poems, the same year as Lowell would follow up life studies with imitations, such loose translations, that the loss of poetry in translation became a topic of wide intellectual discourse, landing in the Atlantic and Time magazine. Finally, the last cave, the 11th, of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Kirbet Qum Qumram on the West Bank had been discovered so recently in 1956 that the young poet and scholar descended from the 13th century Talmudist Rabbi Meir of Rothenburg must have found the discovery of 900 texts in a vernacular, if indeed a vernacular is a language without an army and a navy, unknown, a profound shift in a fundamental canon. And if the canon of primary Jewish texts could shift, enlarge, accommodate, and likewise the Peruvian poet be read alongside the French, the chants, songs, litanies, heretofore undocumented as literature and or uncollected, and the deciphering by linguists and social scientists of texts in alternate alphabets and systems of representation was a vast new source and area. Of course, this is plundering, as any history is, as the versioning of texts authored in alternate sign systems is, as is the willful embrace of a canon by any poet in order to sample and distort and converse with it. I am choosing a set of coincidental dates that exclude others and so present one possible cauldron for the brewing of ethnopoetics in the early 60s. A poet inherits her or his time in the broad sense, but it would be difficult for even the most scrupulous biographer to account fully for the idi idiosyncratic sense. Armand Schwerner was one of the original excavators, selectors, versioners, and technicians of the sacred ethnopoetics founding anthology compiled through the first years of the 1960s and published in 1967. And this is the later edition expanded to include European texts, um, early religious texts, as well as um, almost 200 page, pages of the commentaries, um, also an expansion on the original. Just as the appropriated or embroidered and translated interviews published as Black Elk Speaks, a book Carl Jung had championed in the 40s, began a mainstream resurgence as a bestseller to the generation looking for, ironically, authenticity, a colonialist projection of the native to counter Tang and Fizzies. Good. Praises of Ogun who smashes someone into pieces that are more or less big. His town's got stuff in it most people couldn't guess at. Ogun is called a thief by definition. Ogun is master of the crown. Big, un, big Ogun props up on his head. Ogun is Orisha, number three. He's master of his town. No, he won't leave anyone alone who badmouths Ogun like a thief. He's very rich and mighty. He hires an elephant to say prayers to his head. He kills the husband in a fire. He kills the wife in her foyer. He kills the babies when they try to run outside. He takes somebody's head off if he feels like. He covets his neighbor's prick. Even if there's water in his house, oh, gun washes up with blood, etc. That's probably a quarter of the whole text we're given. And in the commentar commentaries in the back, um, this is the, the whole of uh, the, the, the citation to this. Um, Praises of Ogun's source, um, Jerome Rothenberg's translation selected from the French of Pierre Verger, Notes sur le culte des horizas et Vaudun, 
um, published in Dakar in 1957. So in other words, Thomas Tansell would be apoplectic by now. It, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a version of a French version of some overheard original, how it was originally uh, apprehended by the, um, the French uh, transcriber, one doesn't know. Um, Ogun is the, is the god of iron and is worshiped by all those who use iron. He is a semi-historical figure who has become an Arisha, in other words, a mediary between the Olorun, the supreme god, and man. The Arisha personifies some aspect of the divine power, and each Arisha has his own set of colors, materials, etc., assembled from a number of local variants. These praises of Ogun give a compound image of his range and power. For a description of the Yoruba Oriki praise poem, see page 477. <laughs> so that's the context for the language we saw earlier. Um, and again, it's a massive undertaking um, that occupied the early 60s, the compilation of this, and has been an ongoing, well, has been refined, expanded, um, uh, segmented in Jerome Rothenberg's other um, anthologies throughout um, throughout his lifetime, um, including the recent uh, ones with Pierre Joris um, that compile a huge host of texts without any kind of um, um, attempt to group them under the rubric of what he uses in his introduction. Even in the um, later 1984 um, revision, the word which he disparages but says there still is no better substitute unless you use technicians of the sacred, um, the word primitive for these texts. Um, so that gives you a sense of what is, was in the original anthology and Armand Schwerner worked very closely with um, Jerome Rothenberg. It again, at least in the idea I have it and I'm trying to inculcate in you, is, um, was a, a sense of a heroic and, and necessary undertaking, something to counter um, the stiffness of the early uh, volumes of, um, of Robert Lowell and also the solipsism of the Beats and Allen Ginsberg. Um, again, reacting to an inheritance and to a climate of their time um, in trying to enlarge the world of poetry um, even as they necessarily colonized everything they touched like Midas. Um, so that gives you a sense of the enterprise and there were various um, anthropologists, Dennis Tedlock, who spent his, has spent his life um, investigating the systems um, surrounding these texts, um, linguists and the like. In other words, some of it is as much social science as it is a kind of um, literary undertaking. Um, and like all poets, since both Armand Schwerner and Jerome Rothenberg were poets working on their own work at the same time, there was a sense as poets are generally opportunists um, that they could borrow and they could, they could increase their own scope, ambition, achievement through reading and rating these texts um, for their own purposes.
In the year following the publication of Technicians of the Sacred, the first eight tablets of Schwerner's lifelong work were published in a slim volume by Cummington Press, a little enterprise in Iowa. A 1971 collection of the tablets included seven more. Two years later, Phil Nyblock filmed Schwerner reading the second from the first set and the 13th from the 1971 edition. Um, I can project both um, I can project the text on the left, although it's going to be difficult for you to read it since I can't, unfortunately, get it much bigger while still showing his reading. Let me see if I can enlarge it this way. Any of it? No? Um, let me enlarge it a little further before, before I start the Phil Nyblock film, um, just so you get a sense of, um, just so you get a sense of the, the, the visual elements of it. Um, there was this uh, tiny table at the beginning which showed how you were to read the characters and you'll hear how he acknowledges the characters in his reading. Later performances, um, by the time I heard him, he was um, in his late 60s, I guess, and had incorporated various um, primitive instruments in his performances, which he would go to here and there. Um, they were best when they were fairly impatient, when he was pissed off. Um, the performances. The early one we see, uh, we'll see, is one that was that was sort of he he's a little he's a little impatient, but you can tell he's sort of taken with himself too. Mm -hmm. So that coexists. Um, just to give you a sense um, of the notations which he elides and explains otherwise in his. Um, in the reading that he'll do of it, it starts out by saying this tablet consists of a, oh yeah, you cannot read this, <laughs> um, consists of a numbered list, at least a few of the units may be titles to chance which have never been found or which uh, have never been written. Its exact placement in the context of the series is a problem. Um, and then the first notation that comes up in, in the numbered list The idiosyncratic placement of the central horizontal cuneiform wedges suggests the word may be Greek, but he'll articulate that in a slightly different way. Um, so I'll just give him full screen since you really can't see anything here. Um, it's about 11 minutes, so settle in. He's going to read again number two of the tablets, which are presented without introduction. Um, he does have, he did append notes to a later, a later volume in the back, but they're not at all. They're more sort of uh, like a notebook would be as you were doing a project, um, not as scholarly notes or an attempt at scholarly notes as in the um, technicians of the Sacred Anthology. Um, it's a nice bridge in the background. Then it says strings and pieces. The last part of the line is missing. Three. The children dance in waters of fish death. The word dance, there's a note that says the idiosyncratic placement of the central horizontal cuneiform wedges suggests that the word may be breathe, in which case the line reads, the children breathe 
in waters of fish death. Four, they are dry scales, then there's a missing section. Five, on the inside their scales are wet. Six, they are empty holes, why do they walk and walk? Seven, the missing section, children, eat untranslatable strings and pieces. Eight, the empty children run in their patterns. The word patterns sometimes means shoes, so that we have the line, the empty children run in their shoes. Nine, the pig, which sometimes means the god, waits, untranslatable section, fish death. Ten, the children, the rest of the line is untranslatable. Eleven, the children, untranslatable section, ball games. Twelve, the children, untranslatable line. Thirteen, the children, untranslatable must eat, which really means must, could, want, will eat. Rain. Pinter pnit! Which apparently is some kind of exclamation, like Alleluia or Sella. 14. The road, there's an untranslatable part. Penis thinking. Pinter pnit! 15. Sometimes they walk on the river road with crocodile. Pinter pnit! 16. They can walk near the Knom in their stupid ignorance of fish death. The Knom is known as the spirit which denies. 17. Oh, they are stupid. They are lacking. They walk and walk and walk. 18. They separate fish and death. 19. They do not separate fish and death. 20. Near the Knam, they tame the Orach. Pinterpnit. 21. Not far from the Knam on spring nights, they tame the Urus. Pinterpnit. 22. In stupid ignorance, in stupid ignorance, how do they walk and walk? 23. In walking the river road, they tame Wisent. Pinterpnit. There's a note. The Orach, the Wisent, and the Urus are large, long-horned ancestors of the modern bull, it would appear. 24. They are taller than Urus. Pinterpnit. 25. How small they are beside the Urus. Pinterpnit. 26. The untranslatable, to suck the rain. 27, untranslatable, very warm on our knees. 28, the long men, which may mean priests. There's a missing section, to eat the children. 29, not merely to eat, but the blood, untranslatable section. 30, not merely to eat, but the knam, untranslatable section. 31 is all completely missing, except the last word, which reads, forever. 32, brains and liver, untranslatable section, many favors. 33, the sun, the sun, the sun, the power for all of us. Power sometimes means damage. So we have the line, the sun, the sun, the sun, the damage for all of us. 34, we have made no mistake. The energy, the energy, 35, the sun sits in the testicles of the pig or the sun sits in the testicles of the god. 36, the sun, the entire remainder of the line is missing. 37, the long house, missing section, yellow. Yellow may mean north, yellow may mean shad, yellow may mean vomit. 38, the sun from the cod, 39, the sun from the cod, 40, the sun from the cod, 41, the sun from the cod, 42, the sun from the cod, Pinterpnit!
End of tablet two. Number 13. This chair, this yellow table, these pots, this tablet clay, this lettuce, this lettuce, this stone jar, these blue flowers, this silver lioness, this electromass on her rain ring. Here's my eye, and here's the great emptiness surrounding an object hating me, this tablet clay hating me, separated from its name, this stone jar hating me, separated from its name, outlining a piece of the air to sliver me through this piece of blue flower, hating me, surrounding myself in anger with me, in anger with me. Copper adds is hating me, the white green light around the scribe, the market pile, the lettuce hating me in a white green light separated from its name to sliver me with ice. There's a note by the scholar translator who says, psychotic rant. What surprises, however, he says, involves the degree of non-analogic type of reasoning. Atypical, perhaps, personally and culturally, of the thought modes of archaic literature, Sumerian, Hebrew, Ugaritic, and so on. But the author of 13 was very likely a cured schizophrenic, looking back, intensely directed to assess her past. When I was four, the liver said, you will choke, you will puke out your heart. Oh, in your life, your life, your life, in the pit of your thinking stomach and your feet caught in the swampy muck by the knom in your son, separated from his name, hating you. Let it come down, said the star, Nergal, which apparently is the bringer of pestilence and death, the sun god of midsummer. And the next line is untranslatable, and the last part of it is missing. In the nightmare of the liver lobes, I used to read the face of luck from the back of a burnished brass mirror saying, walk death. Untranslatable section, gallbladder and day-long white-green trance in the bloody, fresh sheep gall ducts surrounding me and my balls were cut. Who do you know who threes? Who do you know who threes? and let it come down. The young lettuce is separated from its name and grows dwarf. The blind light surrounds the heron, flying in a form to augur the end of my name. Uyar Archeyu, Uyar Sharvarezer, Uyar Yorch. According to the translator, the transliterated sounds either did or did not mean something. The phonemic structure confuses and the regressed ego cries. Underneath bronze, not bronze, chameleon changes to green, no life chameleon, no change, saying walk death. The next line is missing. Tablet, tablet, how do you go? I don't know. The next line is untranslatable. The penis is offering, I walk underwater, last year I had a woman open to the rain and flood, or else a man with breasts shining in a brass light in a room. I walk underwater. The next line is missing. Who do you know who threes and grows dwarf? Come down or come down if you gave me sour milk, Begin, 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 begin the voyage with quick food. Quick food, apparently, is an ambiguity. Does this mean that it's quick to digest or quick to nourish? Or is it the sacred mushroom, Amanita muscaria, which, like all mycelial production, seems to sprout suddenly? like magic from the subsoil. 
begin to begin. Give the eye to the socket. Surround the nostrils with the nose. Encircle the cave of the mouth with lips and the asshole with fat cheeks. The mantis eats her lover after all is done. Neck first, let it come down, but begin. Begin to begin. Jar, name, table, name, lettuce, object, tablet, clay, name, name, name. Eye, mouth, eye, nostril, lip, cave, as tablet, clay, mouth, name. Take light, wash away light, together, eye, nose, face, name, name. Um, so that's our <laughs> Schwerner reading from the tablets. And what fascinates me about this particular text, um, and I'd recommend it to anybody, and you can hear him, um, uh, both pen sound and uh, I think this is, this is, Phil Nyblock has various sites in which he has this, but Penn Sound also has this, as well as audio files at different points in his life, Armand Schwerner reading the entire text. Um, but what fascinates me about this is it seems such a crystalline example of a poet's relationship on a very deep level with ambivalence for a kind of work or a, po a kind of poetry that they love. Um, and it's particularly pronounced, I think, because the climate out of like his mushroom, he just said, grew out of nothing. The climate out of which this came was so lacking in irony that it was entirely sincere in its aspirations um, and that he was fully within that, continued to collaborate with Jerome Rothenberg to attend to these excavated or revisioning of texts throughout his life um, and yet also continued to write these tablets which so clearly are a kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's like a Sherry Levine, it's like Kenny Goldsmith or, or, um, or Yasu Sada entire in terms of this constructed fake text. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no pretense that it was somehow even borrowed or transliterated you know, um, dug up, um, and did so with what I think you heard was clear reverence for this kind of enterprise, and yet an acknowledgement of how absolutely ridiculous the whole undertaking was in terms of the undercutting that he constantly does, um, and he borrows from aspects, just as in the Song of Algon that we saw, um, he borrows from aspects of those, of the texts that ended up in Technicians of the Sacred, in there what Rothenberg describes as a kind of, you know, um, I forget how he puts it exactly, but it's, oh, the animalness of the body. So you get these references which are alternately gross and sexual and in your face um, in the same spirit um, perhaps as, the, as, as some of these constructed texts in the Technicians of the, from the, of the Sacred. Um, and yet with a particular spin that perhaps to me um, at coming to this kind of work like Earth Mother <laughs> um, was somehow more assimilable because the ridic he seemed to find the same things um, laughable in a way. And to sustain both of those things 
in this extended work seems to be to be an example of what we all try to do in our best work, which is to sustain two things that are absolutely contradictory in the Keatsian sense, um, and thereby represent the various selves of Denise Riley in one. Um, our relationships with works that we love are very complicated, and this seemed to me to be a really terrific example displayed of that complication. So that's really all I wanted to present, and I would be really curious about your reactions, again, corrections, any kind of, um, any kind of comments you may have about the work and your understanding. insofar as in order to undertake something like this to begin with, um, and it's evidenced by the kind of apologia that prefaces both the early, the early edition and the later edition, with a kind of seriousness of purpose and a, uh, a belief that it was somehow a, um, a, uh, a noble act to appropriate all of these texts with minimal context and put them in one readable volume, basically. Um, and so that in the tablets, which what we see over the 30 odd tablets is a kind of reverence for that and a buy-in, like yes, this is important work. None of these were known. We only knew, you know, civilization to be European, Western, the kinds of things that we now take for granted in terms of questioning and understanding. And that that serious purpose informed their collection. And at the same time, this idea that somehow a person on Staten Island who had gone to, to, um, to Columbia for his BA and gone back for his doctorate, um, who had been born in Vienna and moved to the States when he was nine, um, could easily construct according to this rubric um, and incorporate the kinds of self-serious, almost to a pale fire degree, um, commentary and uh, informing sort of religious constructs in which, you know, the, the, the speaker is somehow the shaman and um, all of that authorial baggage that we also question without even thinking now, um, that he could poke fun at it simultaneously, to me indicates that there was an ambivalence in his love of all of this stuff, and the texture of it, I guess. So, but if others hear other, if you heard other things or other, I'd love to hear, you know, this is again, this is like a, um, you know, it's a single line argument and it should be 
rhizomatic, as they say. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in a way, kind of what I kept thinking about um, during the talk was um, like an awareness of the preposterousness of. <laughs> Well, for me, sort of, that's an evergreen, as they say in the news business. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm prone to see that. Um, just, yeah. I, 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 but it does. It doesn't. I think that my fascination with this is reflective of my fascination whenever it crops up. There isn't a particular. In other words, I'm not, it, 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 it's not a pointed kind of parallel um, to anything that's, that's going on now. But especially, yeah, especially as you, as you sort of, well, time really does do something. And seeing um, the kinds of, fervors, I guess, that infect uh, poets who haven't been through several cycles of them um, is something that's new to me, I guess. And so maybe I'm thinking about that, and particularly in these kids who weren't really kids because Rothenberg had been served in the army in the meantime. You know, all of this other stuff, they were in their late 20s at least, if not early 30s, um, by the time they were working on this project. Um, but seeing the particular um, enthusiasms, I guess, um, is, is, is also something that I've been thinking about because I do, I do see it more clearly now that I have been through a few cycles myself. Yeah. I'm interested in the many moments when he said untranslated. <laughs> and um, yeah. I'm, I'm reading that as his gesture of actual deep earnestness. That I have mm -hmm. something that I understand and know that you, audience, cannot know. Uh -huh. so I have something to say, to project, that I am withholding from the thing. Or unable to. Yeah. Unable to translate, but I. I Yeah, um, yeah. That maintains this authorial command right. over a fall material. Um, I also saw that expressed when he said, or this, or that. Right? The second thing that he offered is always the more interesting thing. <laughs> it's always the more funny thing. And that's what he really wanted to say. So I'm interested, not just right. in the irony, but the fact that he really wants to say, uh -huh. which is what I have. I own some understanding. 
Right, right. Yeah, and in fact, what that, I mean, that, the gesture of those untranslatable moments could go in so many directions because I, I think that's true, you know? Um, and, 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 but also it's a kind of deflection um, at those moments of um, maybe there is something deep I want to say, but who's going to say it to you? But I'm writing a poem. But you know, this is I, I am trying to say, but forget it's. It's almost like a postmodern kind of deflective mm -hmm. moment, um, and then it does act as this foil for you know the the sort of pretension of in a in a pale fire way of, of the commentator um, and the translator. Um, it's like you know, well, the line before this was like lettuce or penis and then it's untranslatable like right exactly but yeah. the scholar translator functions as a persona i mean this, yeah so in tablets is very much a poundian satire i yeah. think he's taking elements of pounds cantos the paratranslated texts he's taking the collage elements but it's all happening through this persona he's created of the scholar translator who is hapless. Right. He can't tell the difference between pattern and shoes. That's the first line of the first tablet. You know, everything is, everything is right. pattern, could be shoes. Right. <laughs> and and, so, and then, so it goes on and there are all these yeah. kind of paratextual elements that he keeps bringing in to, to sort of uh, explode the satire. But I think that I think the satire is not, it's not necessarily ironized. I think he uses a lot of irony, but he's not trying to be satirical in the way that we think of something like, you know, Stephen Colbert. I mean, he's not just, yeah. this isn't the King's satire. Not really, yeah, I think there's a little, I think there's a Dada shtick there too, mm -hmm. which is he's trying to get to some kind of um, energetic, energetic source that perhaps was uncovered or discovered in these, in this, this kind of, um, um, you know, an equivalent to technicians of the sacred might be the things that David Byrne and Peter Gabriel were doing in the 80s, where they were just plundering world music to create, you know, this kind of new soundscape. Um, but I think he's kind of saying, um, well, so what? I mean, this, I, I just found the energy this is it. I, I mean, I, I, I think, I agree, I think, mm -hmm. with you. That I think the tablets is magnificent. I think it's this work of such a, a generative intellect. And somebody who had a really funny sense of poetry in relation to its often uh, absurd seriousness. You know, and he was able to make something that um, was really impressive in that sense. And using the metaphor of, or this kind of analog of, of cuneiform and these ancient tablets that are somehow so perplexing that they can't be brought into to life except through this, through these holes and through this this weird performance. And that that seems to be um, uh, that's really intriguing, particularly because it's it's so little known. I mean, people don't read it or don't really care about it. And it's such a great kind of energetic summoning of that era and then especially modernism. I think he just he nailed modernism in that poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cantos is a really good kind of one fest for that. Yeah. 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 Ooh. Yeah. Um, I was really happy to hear you talk about this. I might be writing a book about this. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> not this exact thing, but the, the sort of dream of a um, global Thank you. 
decontextualizing, I mean pointedly decontextualizing acts of translation and publication, like going as far back as Aldous um, translating Homer or translating Dante and stripping away the philological commentary to bring the poem closer to people in these portable editions and sort of steal Dante away from scholasticism and give it back to a kind of um, readership of exchange that could appreciate it as poetry or pounds um, acts of translation. Um, I mean, Li Ho and, or Li Hahu, as he calls it, mediated by the Japanese, or even Anne Carson's Sappho, which, I mean, I don't see the untranslatable as a translator um, who has a lot of sympathy for Emily Apter's work on the untranslatables and, and for all of this discourse surrounding the untranslatable. I don't see that as a kind of gesture of mastery, except insofar as it's marking a hole that is impossible to fill. Um, so Sappho, the, the lacunae in Sappho's Fragments and Anne Carson are acting in quite a similar way, I think. And that makes me uh, very interested in this work. And, and I think it's, um, I think it's a great counter to the provincialism of contemporary English language poetry and criticism. So it's interesting because if you want to be completely politically correct, you can't know, raid this work, and, there's, and yet there's something about it that is admirable for its sort of trouncing of these boundaries and of the narcissism of confessionalism. So I guess I just, mm -hmm. yeah, I could keep going on and on about this because I'm really fascinated by this yeah. whole project, yeah. but I guess I wonder how you would distinguish this from those earlier I'm not sure I would. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that our own, our own sensitization to this particular instance is also a historical moment. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, it's what I suggest that poets, you know, do. I mean, opportunism is part and parcel of it. And that in any kind of borrowing or sampling or um, replication, there is that kind of absolute disregard for the original. And, um, and yet I also understand the perspective of yes, but the purpose is al also has a kind of noble aspect to it, which even the, you know, the, the sort of recasting Dante did. Um, so that, so that it, it's a, it's just a sticky wicket, the whole, <laughs> <laughs> the whole shebang. Um, and, I, and I don't, I don't think you know that it's more severe or less severe or I I any, but I think that our sort of approach to it from our mindsets now is, who are these? You know? Although an interesting counterexample would be a poet like Irina Furieta, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I recently confronted saying how it's really interesting that you're collaborating
too, um, which ha is, you know, defensible on many levels, the same move, or, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm totally vibing with the contours of the conversation following <laughs> the reading. Um, I wouldn't even say that to me that this, this work kind of enshrines the ambiguities and the aporias and anxieties and ownership and appropriation and replication, and even theology, mm -hmm. just uh, devotion and prayer. Um, not even not even in the, not even yoking two of the diverging impulses to replicate and you know satirizing that that kind of domineering and um, gluttonous need to do so. Right. So the, the, I want I want to I put forth this work, but you know what? It's ridiculous that I'm going to do so. So here's a commentator messing up so poorly. But there's that dialectic, right? But there's a third, and this is the the, the, the third spot that I didn't catch when I was just reading the text, and now I see it being performed is it's really a triangulation, you know? There's the commentator, there's the text, and then there's Armand, you know? So it's, it's even more complicated. So, you know, Akori is a balance, of course, but like, it's like leveling, you know, you keep getting taken out and then you're getting something, you're getting put back even somewhere farther away. So it's, it's really mm -hmm. remarkable, I think. Yeah, yeah. Is anyone here a, a, re a scholar of Renaissance drama or remembers their Renaissance drama a little bit more? Than what is the figure on stage off to the side that's echoing the skepticism of the audience called? Anything? Well, I, I lost that word, but yeah. Something, what you, Parabasis is kind of like what is mm -hmm. going on, right? Because he's, he's kind of stepping out of the, of the voice of the commentator and, and of the voice of the source text and kind of assuming this uh, spectator, spectatorial role. Right. So it's kind of like I'm just the reader. This is what it says. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that might, mm -hmm. that, that's not the word you're looking for, but that might be something. Yeah, yeah. Something. Yeah, that's apt, yeah. <sighs> yeah. I'm just thinking about the stickiness of the <laughs> wicket and how to make it stickier if you want it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would that would be really yeah that would be really interesting to look at. I mean, a, a somewhat more condensed. Uh, I, I know that this sort of appropriation of the um, of the internment camp voice in the Yasasada um, hoax was you know part of the kerfluffle there. I don't mean to minimize it by calling it a kerfluffle, but you know. Um, and, um, but definitely, yeah, yeah. Can we talk about yeah. also from another historic perspective? I don't know if you were there when the PSA in the early 90s sponsored Jerome Rothenberg. It's perhaps when the paperback version came out, oh, Poetry Society of right. America. We were doing a Native American festival, and the Native American writers were up at arms that Jerome Rothenberg was there and he was included in the Native American Festival because they said, how could you, go to Society of America, include this you know, guy who's been colonizing our literature? Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting to hear you now talk about it mm -hmm. how many years later. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly, that's, ex that's exactly one of the wickets that's sticky. <laughs> what is a wicket? I, well, I don't know, what is a wicket? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it can be plural. The, the work also opened up performative dimensions of um, poetry that were not yeah. necessarily available to English language contexts at the time. So as problematic as a 
Mm -hmm. um, that he's really playing up the haplessness of the translators. That, that's sort of a different um, strain of performance, but it is totally different from the, the kind of um, reading situation of, say, Lowell reading at the Guggenheim or something, um, in which the most that could happen was John Berryman is dead drunk or something. And, um, <laughs> Had to be propped so, up. Yeah. Well, he's. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's constructing a religion through these texts that, you know, this, this, this constellation of gods that is taken as just for granted, that of course this is part of this, but, um, and, and yet there is a kind of real, I mean, that so much in that, in that cauldron, I think of that time, you know, had to do with a sort of um, address of the spirit in some form, a way to repackage in a way, so that it wouldn't be the 50s God, the church God, but another kind, so that because those desires were there, um, yeah, it's, that's, that it is a whole other Dimension. What I'm looking at just in terms of, you know, from a literary standpoint, but what if an anthropologist was to really listen to this? Would it, would it open their mind to, like, oh, they're really invigorating the real uh, meaning of these uh, of texts? I mean, or are they really exemplifying that? Or would it look as much as, like, sort of a sham? And I think that would be a very interesting point to consider if it's really. What, what world is it valid in? If it's not valid in the poetry world completely, is it, you know, I mean, I guess it's expression and it's, it's, it's exploration and that's art and that's great and that's all we need, but, you know, it's interesting to take it out into the other sort of social mm -hmm. worlds because it sort of is in a different context. And yeah, if none of the frames were there, yeah. would it be seen as a kind of, yeah. Reality um, of sorts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. Um, and this was really, be but I don't, I don't, I'm not clearly an anthropologist, nor do I claim to know much about it. But as, as much as I do know, this also preceded sort of the circumspection of the late 70s and early 80s in the discipline of anthropology, where what sort of like, how much of I, am I altering, how much am I, you know, shaping the situation okay. by my participation and all of those kinds of questions that until then it was simply, you know, we're going to go in, we're going to study this culture, we're going to get it down, yeah. kind of optimism again, or, yeah. Can you talk more about your reaction as a woman? Because, um, <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Um, but yeah. I just wonder what the reaction of the time. That I don't know. I, like just I haven't, sort of yeah, hard. I don't know. And again, not having done concerted scholarship on that, you know, I haven't investigated that. I'd be really curious. I know in his second preface, Rothenberg did make a point of including one Barbara Ice, I think, in um, a, a, as one of the translators um, that did brought work to the volume, and there were a couple of you know Barbara Rothenberg, and there were some people at the time who were um, who were affiliated I, but without going back to look at the literature or interview or, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and I'm not sure that I can say really any more than I indicated at the outset that it should see. <laughs> um, like, okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a woman coming to this, that it just, at, at, at first understanding, um, which was late because I was really, um, I really came, uh, you know, I was schooled in a different tradition, so it wasn't until I was probably in my 30s that I started reading around and, and found any of this. And, and, but it, it, it just seemed like, what? Great, kind of. <laughs> um, and a lot of that had to do with, as a woman, looking at this stuff that um, at that point, again, in the historical moment, you know, sort of like, ah, shaman, uh, all of that, earth mother, you know, 